Hello everyone and welcome back to COS, our course on commercial open source startups. This is the second lecture of the first part of three of the course on software products. Last time we introduced the software industry. Now we will be discussing what software products are and then move on to software vendors, those who produce software products. We have a lot of ground to cover today. Also, we will have to look at what is intellectual property, how are software products structured from a business perspective, how does product architecture and its life cycle inform choices about how to structure, build and sell a product. So we mentioned uh, what a product is last time, a man-made good sold to a market. In there was the observation it's a good, it's not a labor-based service. For a market, there are many potential customers, not just one client. Then a software product is a digital good, uh, meaning it's virtual, it's not physical, it doesn't rot. Uh, it's pure, arguably, intellectual property. There's some interesting effects of things being wholly virtual, for example, near zero copying costs. You can make a second copy of some piece of software at almost no costs, which is very different from physical tangible goods where you need to have machinery and factories to create uh, more copies. From the product perspective, again, it is important that a software product like any product is aimed at many customers, not just one in a market that somehow groups the customers into uh, into well, a group. Products have life cycles. They are born, they grow, and they might die eventually. Some are more long-lived than others. And they evolve in the meantime. So they are very malleable. Software is very malleable. Uh, at the same time, can be quite hard to change, given that uh, any change could also introduce bugs. So here's the basic model of uh, how I look at products in the software products in this course um, and that is based on the evolution stages or extension stages of what constitutes a software product. There's a core which you start with then based on the core you will build a basic product and eventually you will have a whole product. This is aligned with the life cycle of a software startup. You cannot do everything at once. Uh, you need to make choices and you're advised to start with a core product first and build it out. Um, so we will also be looking then at different uh, customers who buy at different times, given how complete or whole your product effectively is. We will be discussing these in things. Core means really the core software, the bare bones software. Basic product turns the core product or the core software into a usable product uh, because now you're licensing it out with some guarantees and support services and the whole product is the convenient for everyone to use product where you have all the bells and whistles eventually in place that at least some of the larger and more established companies expect. And that is already this, these three stages of a product are building out a product are really important to get right because your market or the subset of customers and markets who might buy from you uh, correlate strongly with the stage of completion or wholeness of your product. If you have really just the bare bones product, let's say the, the core product, just the core software and a little bit of uh, functionality and support around it, then a large company to who your product is not so critical, will not buy. The only buyers for you with the bare bones product, barely there, uh, are what's called here the innovators and early adopters. They see business value in your incomplete product, your barely complete product. They see so much business value that they're willing to deal with the inconvenience of so many things still missing. From your product and those are the ones who buy 
those are the ones who give you, the software startup, the, uh, the software vendor, the early indication you might be onto something with your product. And then comes what's called the chasm, because you need to realize that you need to go from core product to basic product and whole product, because the next, the second, the much larger group of potential customers called the early majority here, they actually look at your product differently. They are not buying the innovation as much as they are buying the uh, business value in the larger scheme of things at their company. They are still innovative. They are the early majority, uh, but they are not going to. They are not willing to try untested, uh, early, bare bones uh, software. They expect uh, at least uh, the resemblance of a whole product. And afterwards, um, there is the late majority and laggards. So that means you already made it, and you're selling into established markets. And they certainly have a long list a long checklist of things that your product must be able to do before they even consider buying it. So what you see on the screen is, uh, is a model by Jeffrey Moore uh, called uh, laid out in a book Crossing the Chasm because that chasm between the early adopters, the innovators and early adopters who are willing to buy and pay for a bare bones product and the early majority where revenue really starts happening money really starts happening who want to buy a whole product and not the core the bare bones product crossing that chasm is really hard because you need to reorient so many things it's a different customer group with different expectations your product needs to change your company needs to change which is why i use this model since so many startups die in that chasm so what is it then that you could be selling? Uh, you can see it structured here. Uh, the whole product is, uh, includes the basic product, which in turn includes the core product. So let me work inside out from the core product. Um, that would be the core software uh, that you see. And maybe you want to already structure that software into aspects of core software and additional drivers that might uh, you might sell separately. Uh, you definitely need, even for the core product, some complementary materials, documentation and training materials. Without at least some of that, it will be really hard to sell. And of course, you need some way of support. You can try with uh, mostly self-help services, putting some of the documentation on the web, having forums where users can help each other, etc. Though eventually, of course, you want to sell support as well as part of the product. What you're selling is usage rights to your product. Uh, software never sells the software itself unless you're a consultancy and you sign over the copyright to your customers. If you're a software vendor selling a product to a market, you usually just sell a license to use the software because you want to sell your uh, those licenses to many. And if you have sold the actual software, you could only have one customer. So the pricing of such usage rights uh, can vary drastically. That's a deep topic. Price lists, pricing strategies are a deep topic where people specialize. Just to give you an idea, you could look at the number of users and price accordingly. More users means um, higher price. Um, the machines needed, the, the processor units needed, the time used. Um, you can make the license perpetual forever or you could limit it to a year or even a month. Um, you have different ways of structuring payments. For example, the classic way is to have an initial license fee and later on a maintenance fee, which is much lower than the initial license fee, but more so more increasingly today, it's usually just subscription. So beyond this core product, there's the basic product. So you want to go from core product to basic product. And that means you have, uh, you add things to it. You add what your more established customers, the less, less risk seeking customers, uh, want, which is you will add some form of guarantees about fitness for use. 
you will add certification. That uh, means that the software is certified to, for example, run on certain hardware um, and so forth. You want support service, want to offer support services or customers want that hotline support, on-site servicing, what have you. And beyond that, your maturing product gets whole, becomes a whole product. Once you start adding training, consulting, uh, and even the operations of your product as a cloud service, for example, or as a service for your customers. So there are many, many different aspects to what starts out small as a piece of software to turn it into a whole product. And I'll go over this in more detail in this lecture. At the core of a software product is the intellectual property, meaning the source code uh, and possible tab, uh, patents and so forth. So what is this intellectual property? Um, well, uh, first of all, it's property. Uh, so it is something that you can own. Uh, you have some form of title to the property, could be land, for example. And so you have a title to uh, some, some real estate. Intellectual property then is a special version of property that is, well, intellectual, virtual. It's pure mind stuff. Uh, it's not tangible. In a sense, it doesn't rot uh, I, again, um, but uh, uh, of course it might age nevertheless. Um, intellectual property is really unique. Um, you cannot have a second copy of that same intellectual property and it uh, would be, uh, it has to be different. Um, the key to understand about property rights, in particular intellectual property rights then, is that, we'll look at this in a second, but that the states, the countries, the jurisdictions give you exclusion rights for your property. You're inverting things here. Um, exclusion rights means you, as the rightful owner, have the right to exclude everyone else from using your uh, or accessing your intellectual property. So your right is to say no to others. You're not allowed to do that. And businesses results from you waiving those exclusion rights by saying, oh, you specifically, not everyone, but you specifically, dear customer, are allowed to use uh, my intellectual property. I'm waiving my exclusion rights, usually in return for some payment uh, for some license fee. So you can see the different forms of intellectual property listed uh, here. There are uh, there's the IP itself, and then there are the intellectual property rights. So IP and IPR, as you sometimes see it in the literature. Uh, right next to each other. So there is the textual or artistic expression by people uh, and they will be protected by copyright law. Source code, you write, program code you write, falls into this category. It's a textual, unique expression by some programmers, often on behalf of an employer, and then the employer owns the copyright to that work. Patents are another one. So that is a non-obvious invention, innovation, and it's secured to the original inventor, can be secured if they file for it with patent rights. Trademarks, smell, smell marks are protected by uh, trademark rights. These are the unique visual, artistic, whatever expressions that signify to users, to customers, the quality of the product. Uh, the mark signifies that and that's worth protecting. Um, what is not uh, protected because it's not made public are trade secrets. So copyright patents and trademarks need to be uh, uh, filed for. You don't have to file for copyright, but the whole point is it's visible uh, to others and thereby protected by uh, corresponding rights. Trade secrets is what you do not make uh, public but uh, and is protected by trade secret rights. But um, the whole point is that nobody knows about it. And if you were to make it public, you would lose uh, the trade secret rights. So 
going over this in a bit more detail. Um, copyright is the right to the textual expression usually given to the creator. Um, again, if they work for someone who paid them to do it, then the copyright usually goes to that uh, paying party, usually an employer. In German, there is a separate uh, notion of Urheberrecht. So there are some moral rights for the original creator, but the exploitation rights uh, to make money of it, uh, even in Germany, go to whoever paid and acquired the rights from you, even if the Urheberrecht stays with you. Copyright is specific to jurisdictions. In the Western world, uh, countries like Germany and the US have strong copyright and copyright protection, and they are somewhat similar. But there are countries on this planet where there is no copyright. And so you can be in a country that does not recognize copyright, and hence nobody can sue you <coughs> there, for example, for violation of somebody else's copyright. Still, uh, that won't help you if you're an international company, because if you're busy in the US, you have exposure there, and hence um, you can be sued there, and any money you make there can be um, uh, received by those who might win over you in the court for copyright violation. It doesn't help you that you, if you operate out of an African country where, where there are some who don't have copyright protection. So examples of uh, copyrightable intellectual property is, of course, source code, uh, but could also be database schemata, user interface designs, uh, as you write them down. So database schemata, SQL designs, user interface designs, the specific uh, layout of a UI and so forth. Patents are non-obvious industrial inventions and you can acquire patent rights if you file for it um, so that uh, you are known to be the holder of that patent and that's how you acquire the exclusion right. And um, the original motivation of patent rights was uh, to get people to file and lay open the invention rather than keeping it secret, in case of which it would probably be a trade secret, because by laying it open, others could learn from it and build on it. But you would only lay it open if you get some protection for it, so that's why patent law was invented. It's a tricky business because in uh, the US you can have patents for software as long as they are tied to some physical hardware. In the EU, I think you cannot have software patents. Uh, from a strategy perspective for a company, then if you're international, if, again, if you have exposure in the US, that means you need to watch out for patent violation because just because you're a European business, doesn't mean you're protected from lawsuits in the US if you have customers and presence there. And then who doesn't or doesn't want to? There are trademark rights. Uh, so marks are distinctive signs, sounds, smells. So the Nokia jingle that some may still remember is a very, um, very well-known uh, sound that uh, was trademarked and hence is protected. Not everyone can use it, only Nokia can. Um, like with all the other exclusion rights, well, you can't use it if you don't have uh, a license from the original owner. Um, so here are examples, visual examples of trademarks, Microsoft, the term, how it's written, the logo, the Free Software Foundation and the GNU of the Free, Soft Free Software Foundation. Trade secrets are, um, well, secrets. The most famous example being the uh, Coca-Cola recipe or formula that has never been laid open. Nobody knows whether it exists, but we assume it exists. And, um, well, uh, you can require that nobody can use your trade secrets. How would they be able to? Well, only if they steal it. That's the whole point. So trade secret rights protect you from theft of your trade secrets. A more basic example is if uh, someone leaves your company and takes the customer list with them and then moves to another company and starts calling your customers, trying to convince them to come to the new company. 
they, they stole a trade secret of yours, your database of customers, and hence using trade secret rights, you can stop them from using that. You can actually sue them pretty badly if they steal from you like that. Here is a Kindle, an Amazon Kindle. Uh, let's take a look at that. What intellectual property is at work or has been deployed here? Take a moment, think about it for a second. Well, uh, what's depicted here, we can walk through it step by step. So you see some book on the screen, chapter one, something, something. So that's maybe a novel. Someone holds the copyright to that novel, either the author or maybe the publisher, whatever their agreement. So there's copyright. Um, then patents. Well, you look at this uh, e-ink display, this uh, different from the usual LEDs of your or OLEDs or whatever of your monitors. This e-ink display probably has a lot of uh, engineering patents in there, as does the electronics uh, behind it. So there are probably all kinds of patents in play here where people uh, make money of every Kindle that is being sold. Trademarks, a uh, bit less. Obviously, Amazon will probably have trademarked the Kindle terminology and the term, as well as the specific way of how it's uh, printed and visible outside on the um, on the uh, um, on the on the um, cover. So the Kindle at the bottom that you can see there. Trade secrets, you don't see because they're secrets, but your data, or if I bought this Kindle, the information, the digital traces I left with Amazon on me buying that Kindle, when, for what price, all of that would be considered a trade secret. So here you can see it an overview, four main forms of intellectual property rights uh, with different properties itself. Mostly the form, what is it by definition? Copyright is textual expressions, patents is non-obvious innovations, trademarks are marks, unique identifiable marks that signify a certain quality of the underlying product and trade secrets is anything you want to keep secret and is important for your business. The duration of these is such that trade secrets and trademarks do not expire, so you can as long as you keep protecting them, that's a requirement, you can keep having them forever and hence keep having the exclusion right of others forever. Copyright and patent rights expire. Uh, thanks to Disney and what have you, the copyright duration has been extended to nearly forever from a software perspective. So by all means, copyright is from a practical perspective uh, in, in software, at least for now, forever. But uh, and so our but patent rights are a bit less so. Copyright is granted automatically uh, when you write it. You don't even have to register it any longer. I think that pays tribute to the huge amount of copyrightable material that are being created every second. Patents there are much many much less patents, and you can or you have to apply to a patent office, which will then. Um, test and review your application and possibly accept or possibly reject it. Um, trademark rights are also automatically granted when you create the mark, but it would be smart to, to register it. Intellectual property and intellectual property rights form the basis of uh, software products. So let's now look at core product, basic product, and whole product in turn. Core product, again, is the core software, maybe some additional functionality, software functionality, complementary artifacts like uh, training materials, documentation, and what I call self-help services, where you don't really have a support hotline, but do put stuff for self-service, say, on the web these days. In order to sell a product, core product or other, you need to regulate how you sell. 
you want a defined revenue stream want to make money off it and the way to structure selling software products is to use licenses as mentioned selling software products is a shorthand an imprecise one you're always selling a license to use so what is a license well it's a rights grant uh, in which you in which you waive those exclusion rights. You're telling someone you are allowed to use my software, which I am the rightful owner of. It's a contract in most countries, though not exclusively so. There's you, the licensor, and then there's the customer, the licensee. And there could be anything in that contract. Uh, so usually it will have a price and a defined, uh, uh, and it will define how you're waiving your exclusion rights, for example, perpetually or just for a year. There may also be obligations and prohibitions in that uh, license. And that will be particularly important later on for open source licenses. So what you grant by waiving exclusion rights is the use. If it's open source, you even um, allowing for modification, redistribution, redistrib uh, reproduction, etc. Um, could be perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, could be just in Nigeria, what have you. As students, the most common form of license you had to deal with, but maybe didn't even notice, is the EULA, the EULA, the End User License Agreement. If you buy something and it clearly has software in there, again, you're not buying the software, you're just buying a user right to the software. And as you do so, you have to agree to the license and it's implied in you opening the package, so-called shrink wrap license. And what the license is, is the end user license agreement. Because of the large number of consumer products, these are not individual contracts between a vendor, a seller, and a customer. You just open the package and supposedly by the way it's structured legally, you agree to the license. So that's a license. A software license is obviously then a, a license for software and uh, utilizes, as explained, copyright trademarks and patents to prevent that Anyone just makes copies and uses it without paying you anything. So I want to use an example now, or actually four examples, to look at the different components of what constitutes a product. So we have four products, companies slash products. So they all kind of stand for one, one product are uh, here. And two of them are consumer products and two of them are enterprise products and two others and two of them are on premise. So run on your workstation and two of them are a cloud service or as a software as a service. So Tetris runs on your machine and is definitely a consumer product. The game Tetris, Spotify uh, streams from the web. So it's a service mostly, but it's clearly a consumer service. Enterprise software, Render Man is the software uh, movie studios use for CGI in, in, in movies. And Hootsuite is a social media application um, provided on the web uh, to help companies manage their many social media forms of outreach. So these are four different products and we will look at them or use them for example. So core software, uh, we are now talking about the core product and the core software there in, in there. So that would be exactly the software behind these four different products. You can have extensions. Sometimes a good product manager will say, yeah, let's make a distinction between a core software and additional functions. So unlikely to be the case for consumer products, Spotify and Tetris, but definitely Hootsuite and RenderMan might have some functions that are not part of the core software and that you have to pay for extra. Uh, I imagine RenderMan has these various modules for very different uh, modeling, the physical environment situations, all the hard stuff, water, hair, what have you, 
uh, of people uh, could conceivably, I don't actually know, but could conceivably be modules that are not part of the core software. It's a tricky business, that's product management, and that's a different class. You need complementary materials, meaning documentation and training materials for Tetris and Spotify of as consumer products, consumers hate being bled out. And so they expect all of that to be part of the product and are unlikely to pay for it separately. So it has to come with the core product. While maybe documentation obviously comes with Renderman and Hootsuite as well, but training materials could be a separate thing to sell to enterprise customers. Self-help services, your first, first uh, take at uh, finding ways to solve customer individual problems. Uh, that could be forums and mailing lists you set up where people help each other or where maybe you uh, for free uh, also answer, uh, assuming then that some basic level of support with little guarantees as to how timely they are are provided when customers buy. You could have chatbots uh, or self run self-managed online training available for customers either as part of the core product or um, uh, so certainly as part for the, of the core product but maybe with extra uh, to pay for. Pricing is always interesting so um, the core product pricing will actually extend into basic product and whole product because the principles are always the same. Um, you can price by uh, consumption meaning you look, you try, okay, so the fundamental principle of good pricing strategies is that you try to price by the value you're creating for your customers. You try to understand how much more money will they make because of your product in use by them. That is uh, basically customers, smart customers are somehow able to make a return on investment calculation that informs whether they should buy their product, your product or not. If you're more expensive than their return on investment, they'll obviously not buy. If you knew that calculation, you could price all the way up to uh, the cost, uh, up to their investment, consume all of their, their value, all of their gain, and that would be your, your price. Usually will obviously not be, not go that far, but definitely understanding the value you're creating for your customers uh, is a good indicator of how you should price. And then you can do so by various levers. You can price by, uh, because they correlate with the value. More users on the customer side means more value for them. So your price also goes up by the number of users of your software. Uh, it could be the number of cores or processes or machines that the software runs on, because if it runs on more machine power in total, well, it delivers more value to your customers. Um, or if the consumption model is different, simply uh, time uh, it runs, if it's uh, just one of uh, um, uh, algorithms running, for example. You could price or you should price by the availability you sell. Perpetual is obviously the biggest one or should be the most expensive one because you never see any revenue after that from, in the narrow sense, the core product. So today, most of the pricing is time limited, uh, usually then turned into a subscription model, but there really is no, no, um, no limits to being creative here. Maybe your product is so somehow related to Halloween that the real value is only uh, at six, uh, well, not quite 6.60, 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. But uh, priceless are a great way where companies get creative to maximize their revenue. It is also important to see how you deliver that value. So is it some initial license fee when the customer is really gung-ho and has got convinced by your fabulous salespeople? or um, is it just a regular subscription fee and so forth. So um, Spotify, te so Tetris is probably a one-time buy. Spotify is a subscription buy. 
um, and uh, I don't actually know, maybe it has multiple levels. Renderman is more like a traditional enterprise product, I assume, so initial license fee perhaps, and then maintenance fee. Hootsuite as a service is most certainly also a subscription-based uh, model, um, uh, probably also by number of users. Spotify's second account obviously would be another user. So after core product comes basic product. Um, so that is the core product plus things you can guarantee and provide to customers that they want to. And these are now the customers past the chasm. Those are the professional, uh, excited perhaps, but not super excited uh, customers, unlike the innovators. They see the value. No customer buys if they don't see the value. But it's not so much like with the innovators that they see a huge opportunity for their own innovation and increased competitiveness in the market. They see incremental value of it. So they require that your product be a bit more hung and mature than the basic bare bones core product. What's tricky here is always the promises that you as the vendor can make about your product with respect to will it deliver the promised value. The core problem obviously are bugs. Um, no software is perfect, all software is buggy and faulty. Uh, and of course, customers don't like that. If your software stops working at the most critical moment, when it's supposed to deliver the value for its users, then you have a pro then first your customers have a problem, and then not soon thereafter you will have a problem. So customers ask for some fitness for use. That's how it's called, and you have to make some representations about fitness for use as well, because otherwise um, you can't sell, and it would also not be moral to sell something that's completely broken. So. Most products are somewhere in between, uh, pretty good, uh, but with places where they break down. And so the way it's regulated is that you, the vendor, usually get some rights. So you make representations about fitness for use, but then if something goes wrong, you do have a right to fix it before, say, the customer can ask for the money back or even can sue you in court. Uh, for, for over-promising and not delivering. So if the second happens, you can't fix the problem, uh, depending on what's in the contract. Uh, the loss of business that your customers occur might turn into your loss because you have to compensate them for it. Though, naturally, most vendors will really fight hard to keep any such uh, damages out of the contract. Well, which wouldn't possibly stop uh, the customer from suing you for damages in court. Um, interestingly enough, uh, as soon as you take a rational perspective at this, it can be somewhat negotiated. So maybe the price goes up significantly for a product if the customer asks for potential high compensation in the case of loss of business. So that would mean different pricing strategies based on what fitness of for use you provide. Realistically, though, few vendors will, are willing to do that. So they will always try to negotiate, try to negotiate that away. I trust that Tetris almost makes no uh, guarantees about its usability. And given the price point of a game, uh, it's probably not much of a point anyway. Um, Renderman and Hootsuite might be different, and so there are probably representations about fitness um, in there. Maintenance is a traditional term that's slowly going away. So in the traditional world of buying a software product, the customer would pay an initial license fee, and that would cover the user tried maybe for a year and then in a second year with the software in use usually customers want to keep going but they do want for example they do want the user tried still 
um, and so forth. And they definitely do not want to pay the initial license fee again. So they often only then by agreement pay the maintenance fee, or what's called the maintenance fee of maintaining uh, the product for the customer, meaning they receive bug fixes, but they don't, they're not paying a new. Maintenance fees are much lower than the initial license fees, usually about 20%. And, uh, and that's the traditional well way of, of selling. Um, it is some agreement ultimately by which the vendor, the provider of the product stays in the loop with its promises for fitness of, for use. Um, and we'll come to that later. Maintenance, so the combination of initial license fee and maintenance is slowly going away and being replaced by plain subscription. Of quite, quite some importance, at least for on-premise uh, software still, um, but also to some extent in the cloud, depending on what it is that gets certified, is the certification. Certification is, uh, as mentioned in the industries, uh, software industries lecture, is a guarantee uh, that your product does something, has something, works with something else. So the common example would be Linux gets certified, some Linux, uh, SUSE Linux, uh, enterprise server is certified to run uh, with Hewlett Packard storage uh, arrays. So the customers want that reassurance that this software, for example, runs on those uh, on those pieces of hardware, so that they buy them together and can sleep and can sleep more safely at night. Um, certification, going back to the previous lecture, requires that some external agency certifies your product for the given certification mark with which come the promises of, yes, it does work, say, with that hardware software. There are all kinds of certifications. Uh, that some software runs on hardware, that some software does no harm, medical technology software, that it's safe to operate, a car driving around, and so forth. So there is a, a lot of that. It's domain and industry specific, and often a purchase requirement. So a hospital will not buy or any device that is not properly certified for medical uh, use. And that's just a gazillion of certifications you need, which you need to acquire first before you can even make your first uh, sell. So quite hard uh, from a product perspective. Then there are the support services. Um, there will be problems with the users that they can't figure out themselves. They want someone they want to call someone, um, they want to find a solution to their problems. So you may have to offer a hotline support or email support, or even in the old good old days, send someone in person to the customer side to deal with things and so forth. Interestingly, these days, people are much more likely to search the web for answers to the solution before they call you up, but uh, still, companies want to buy that hotline support so they feel better about we can get help if something's wrong. And then you price for it. You charge money for it. Um, the price of your product goes up and that may depend on is it by email? Is it a person answering uh, on the phone? Um, how is that? Um, how much of that? So is it uh, uh, one call per day is allowed, or can you bombard uh, the? Can the customer bombard the vendor? When can they reach them? Do you guarantee answers only during the work week, nine by nine to five, or nine by five, or do you um, guarantee answers every minute of the week, uh, twenty four seven availability of your support services? And then finally. Uh, what's the quality of the service you provide? There's a traditional split in first, second and third level support. The first level support will basically read the manual to you, but doesn't know more than that. Second level support uh, are expert users, power users who really know the software very well and can answer complex questions about using the software. And third level support would be 
usually uh, the developers themselves when you run into a bug where the software simply keeps crashing and maybe you get access to all of them maybe you only get access to the first level support um, all of that can be sold by the vendor to you after core product and basic product we are now nearing whole product the assumption is your product has been maturing it found its market it found its footing and you're making it complete and whole so that it passes every buyer's checklist of things that must be there before the buyer allows it for use by uh, by its company by the company the first thing to understand here again is about the um, uh, about the uh, difference between consumer and enterprise market. Consumers are really much more price sensitive than enterprises and hence you will see how uh, they are willing to spend their own time to figure out things uh, while companies are really thinking of much more rationally about time and are willing to pay someone uh, for um, for solving the problem for you because if they were to use your time then you're not creating value for the company you're trying to fix problems your time ideally is spent on making money for the company not fixing internal problems so Martin Mikos one of the innovators and leaders in the commercial open source space the uh, former CEO of MySQL he said uh, very poignantly some people spend time uh, to save money that would be the consumers and some spend money to save time that would be the enterprises so of those things uh, that you can uh, can um, buy then there's training you can provide uh, in-house training off-site training uh, these are things that belong to the um, whole product and you can price that the way you price training uh, using fixed fees um, by person by volume uh, certainly if you want need to train a whole company they will it's probably not by person they will try to the company will try to negotiate uh, by volume in a different way Consulting could be added. That's what you need when you need to customize the product uh, for, for the customer. And um, this is often needed if you are a startup or a small vendor, because the consulting, the customization of an enterprise product for customers is something that only you can do. You would probably prefer that there was a separate consulting firm which does this job because the business of consulting is so very, is so very different from being a software vendor but often in the beginning it's just not attractive to become a partner of a software vendor with a very small footprint in the market and hence you have to build up your own consulting service and eventually it might fall back and be rolled into something called uh, customer success also, you somehow need to guide and need to help your customers to be successful in the use of the product. The revenue, the value of the product for the vendor is that you sell the product and not so much that you sell consulting, but consulting, as explained earlier, is often simply needed to, uh, by, by customers to get the value out of the product. <clears throat> You could also operate uh, the software for your customers and we will actually look at this in much more detail because that is increasingly the way to go. You do not sell a license for on-premise use to the product any longer, but rather you sell uh, a subscription to using the product in your own, in the vendor's own cloud. 
and the pricing here then becomes uh, similar to or is similar to the usage rights uh, in a license for on-premise use but since there also is in the mix now the operation running the hardware and the customer doesn't have to do that any longer prices usually go up so it's more attractive uh, to sell a subscription than the traditional initial license fee plus maintenance fee so this was a quick rundown through what constitutes a software product uh, from a business perspective what are the various aspects that you need over time how they correlate with a maturity, maturing product and different customer groups will deepen that in the future. Uh, but now I would like to spend a few more thoughts on, so to speak, the innards, uh, the inner workings of a product architecture, because as it turns out, um, any product is a provider for feeds many, many more companies than just the final vendor um, that that is selling the assembled product. So when you look at a product from an intellectual property perspective, there's of course the original work that the vendor, uh, you yourself does the software, but um, you are nevertheless still relying on third parties uh, who provide components for your product. The most obvious one if you're a software startup is that you probably use a gazillion of open source software components in your uh, product. The good news for that is that they don't cost you anything, at least not in license fees, but you do have to spend extra work to comply with the licenses. We will we'll cover this in the second part of this course. Um, but you might be uh, using smart algorithms um, where there are patents that are owned by someone. Um, if uh, you need some label, some trademark to inspire trust by others, um, then uh, you will have to pay them. So effectively, as you assemble a product from some components and add your own uh, secret sauce to it, all those third party components may come with uh, some cost because other companies are making a contract with you, the vendor, where well, they waive their exclusion rights and let you use um, their, their components in your products. So you need to know then what is in your product. Um, if you pay for it, you know that this is in your product because it's painful. But with respect to open source, it's often not at all that clear because well, it's freely accessible on the web, so sometimes developers just copy and paste and lo and behold, you have something in your code uh, that you don't even know um, beyond the original developer who did it and may long have forgotten. So um, you need to look at that and need to understand how things come together. With software, pure software, it's a bit easier. You only need to look at software components, but as soon as the, it's a device, for example, an MP3 player here, uh, it gets quickly more complicated because now there is hardware and with hardware come much more patterns. So in this example here, you can see that the final product is an MP3 player and uh, it's produced by some vendors. So the physical parts are originally owned by the vendor and um, maybe some of the software, the UI, what have you. And the vendor actually in this case sells ownership to the physical parts, though not the software in there. So to the software in there, the vendor sells you usage rights. Now the software in there might have been a composition or combination of multiple software components. Some the vendor owns, others they've licensed from suppliers. And so those suppliers also benefit. Uh, it shows mp3 because there's an obvious patent involved the mp3 patent and hence uh, there's yet another party in this case the Fraunhofer Institute which invented the, um, uh, the patent which gets money for letting you use the patent while playing mp the vendor um, putting the patent into its product and letting you the final consumer 
actually use the software. So it's passed on uh, all the way to the end user. Uh, so Fraunhofer gets money off that by waiving its exclusion rights to its patent. And so you, a product manager needs to look at a product from this architecture perspective as well and the intellectual property rights associated to all components in the product. All components, that's what's called the bill of materials. Uh, so Stückliste in German, the whole set of components and each and every one has an intellectual property rights holder and you need to understand the licenses for it. Finally, uh, products have a life cycle. Uh, like they go to market or strongly correlated to market, uh, they are born, are probably kind of unfinished then, but they do grow. Eventually they reach a peak of maturity, decline and die. They can get revived, so you can see this curve of uh, growth, maturity and decay or decline uh, repeat in new releases as long as the markets are there. But when markets eventually die, uh, so does the software that comes with it. There are many more advanced topics on software products. I only want to point to them. Some of them we will mention in passing in later lectures. Um, certainly sometimes bundling of products is a good idea. Microsoft is leading the way here or uh, has well-known examples as Microsoft Office is a bundling of individual tools, Word, Excel, and so forth. And that way you can make more money uh, and uh, be competitively smart by excluding or preventing competitors from selling products. There's often complements, things that are bought also in pairs because you need them. That is the platform situation. Um, if Word runs best on Windows, then you are likely to buy uh, and the business value you want is the one that Win Word provides, then you're also going to buy Windows. So that's complementary in terms of the functionality, but you need to buy both. And then there are partnerships where other companies resell your products, make sure that they work really well together with yours and etc. and help you upsell, help and upsell to yours. So that's it from, for today, a long lecture again on software uh, products. Uh, software is a product based on intellectual property, something uh, comparatively recent when compared with all the physical tangible property that we would usually buy. But uh, both software can stand on its own, be pure, purely virtual, purely intellectual property based product or comes combined with devices. And then it's a combination of a tangible product and a software product. Key is to understand that products mature and that this growing maturity matches different customer groups. Um, here, I created these three stages or three extension stages of products, core, basic and whole product. Um, and finally, Intellectual property plays a key role in understanding a product architectures and who benefits from the revenues that you generate with your product because you have to pass some on to them. Later in this course, when we talk about competitive strategy, that will be so much more important because, again, all products are built from components and depending on the strength of the position, do you need that component to assemble your product? Do you have alternatives or not? Depending on that, different parties, different companies will benefit more and others will benefit less. And that obviously determines the long-term fate of a company. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next lecture on software vendors.